Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Dave Roberts. Um, he has a electrical engineering degree from University of Victoria and has uh, had a wealth of experience in the computer video gaming industry, as well as currently works as a senior software development engineer for Precision OS Technology Limited. And we're just going to ask you a few questions tonight, Dave. I'm just wondering if you can start off by giving us a little bit of a background on sort of what your educational and career paths were. Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, so I, as Jen mentioned, uh, you know, I started into um, my technical work through engineering, which, you know, coming out of high school was uh, just the usual general courses. You know, take some math, take some science, get accepted, go to school. Um, and the, the path through engineering wasn't um, specific or anything at all to what I'm doing now either. R really, engineering was a path to um, teach yourself how to work hard and how to learn. Um, and, and really, uh, the engineering program was, was a lot about um, developing your own sense that no matter what they throw at you, you're, you're going to be able to accomplish your goals if you take the time to roll up your sleeves and don't give up, really. Um, I'd say that's almost the primary message of an engineering school. Uh, you know, you learn, you learn some math, you learn some stuff, but um, my program was a co-op program, so you went to different jobs. Uh, and for the most part, you know, you come in and you know some math, you have some basic principles, but whatever they were asking you to do, you're, you're always gonna end up um, learning on the job, learning the specifics. Uh, and I think with most technical jobs these days, you're gonna come into it as a, as a new graduate or as somebody learning where you've got a base of knowledge and you're gonna learn the specific skills you need kind of as you go and many, many employers now don't expect people to be experts in the exact specific task but what they want are people who have a proven ability and the confidence that they can learn and are willing to learn and listen and grow into whatever it is that needs to get done uh, and that's that's a super important skill to have right now and that's and that's where um, fully grasping the fundamentals like the, the core the core base skills that you get through your early years of university is, is super important um, and to just you know nothing nobody ever has to be perfect but to get the real fundamental ideas that you can build on uh, I, I would so, say that stuff served me super well throughout my career. So uh, when you were in uh, high school Dave then mm -hmm. did you really have an idea that yes you were going to go into engineering or were you just sort of thinking I kind of like maths and sciences so maybe I'll sort of feel my way. Yeah I happen. I didn't know really that I wanted to do engineering um, until quite a bit, uh, pretty, pretty late. I applied to a bunch of different programs. Um, and the seller for me really was uh, a visit to, to UVic, where, where I went, um, seeing, seeing the facilities there, seeing the staff, and mostly learning about the program as a co-op program, which, which means that um, it was modeled after one that was kind of originated in Waterloo, where you would go to school, you do your first year, but every, right after you've done your first two semesters of first year, you're just alternating through work placements and school four months at a time. And unlike some programs where it's an internship, these are paid positions. So it gave the opportunity to earn some money towards your schooling. Um, I didn't come into it with a, a ton of cash in the bank or anything. Uh, so that was you know, pretty, actually a pretty important consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also gained some really valuable experience too. It was fantastic. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The work experience was great throughout my, my school. I, I worked, uh, let's see at IBM, uh, at Bell Northern research a couple of times, which was Northern telecoms kind of early research division before they went under then working at Northern telecom, like, mm -hmm. and some great jobs. Like, you know, we're, you know, you're a student and you're playing with super expensive stuff and sending things <laughs> off to the electron microscope and you're building, you know, specs for lasers and it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh. um, and then, yeah. So, so when you, 
you graduated. Um, you came out of university and I went skiing. Yeah, that's right. You went skiing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what all students do after they graduate from yeah. university. It was a little bit of a challenging time because both you and I kind of yeah. graduated around the same time. Um, and so difficult job market, different than today. But uh, how did you end up um, getting into the gaming industry? Yeah, well, honestly, the skiing part's important because I came out of university and decided I would take some time, traveled abroad and um, skied in New Zealand. So through our, <laughs> through our summer, worked in Australia for a bit and decided that it was time to put my degree to good use, came home, completely broke and living with the parents. Um, <laughs> and I needed a job fast. <laughs> Uh, and I wanted to work in Vancouver and couldn't get any initial bites on real job experience. So um, literally it was an ad in the paper that kind of pulled me into video games where it was a small new startup company said they were looking for people with um, certain skills that uh, I had learned and done some of on my co-op jobs and some I had done as a hobbyist for fun. Um, but it was just, it was building video games uh, in the early days. So uh, I went down and interviewed and got a job at a new startup company here in Vancouver um, called Radical Entertainment. They're still kind of around in some form. Uh, and uh, so the first job was making a, a game for the Game Boy, the old original very first Game Boy. Uh, and back in those days, it was all kind of cartridge based stuff. So you, uh, games were simpler and it was very small team. So there was like, I was a programmer, I had an artist, we're gonna make this game. Um, and so that was kind of the earliest experience I had doing that. And then we moved on, you know, through that company through about six years, uh, they had some financial hardships and myself and a few other people decided that we would um, jump out before it went down and start our own company. And so that's where we started a company called Black Box Games. Uh, we ran that for not too long before we were acquired by Electronic Arts. Um, so we grew that uh, and did games. At that point, we did games for like PlayStation 2 and 3, um, PC, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so, yeah, then we joined EA. Uh, I worked there for about five years before bunch of those same guys we started a different company <laughs> so you're a bit of an entre entrepreneur as well business yeah i've liked the smaller companies yeah yeah, yeah. and then uh, and then after that company uh that ended in 2016 um through an unfortunate series of events uh three of them well two or two out of the three of them were not our, completely out of our control <laughs> uh, <laughs> But we suddenly had 87 people out of work within a week <laughs> uh, yeah. with no money coming in. So we decided to fold up shop. And a bunch of us were kind of done video games at that point. It had been about 25 years of making video games. So we, uh, I took some time off and some of the other guys that I'd started the company with started getting interested in virtual reality um, developments there. And one of their friends was a surgeon who was interested in improving training and he had some ideas not around virtual reality, but he really wanted to, he thought that the way surgeons were trained just could be a lot better. And those guys were just, you know, it's a classic story. They were having drinks and having just talking and one friend's, you know, hey, have you haven't seen this virtual reality stuff? And they kind of put two and two together. And next thing you know, um, they were planning to start a company to do virtual reality training systems. Uh, so wow. I was kind of, that, and I joined, I at that point I was just taking time off and. Then I joined them as their first employee and uh, we've been going since, uh, I guess about two and a half years, coming up on three. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about um, what your current position is like? Yeah, um, right now I'm, I'm back doing almost exclusively hands-on software development again. So through, through the years at the bigger companies, uh, my role has changed and moved around quite a bit. Um, and, and I think I've been very fortunate to have a great career that way because uh, it's, it's given me a lot of variety. Um, I still really actually enjoy doing a lot of the hands-on work, but um, it can be uh, quite a challenge sometimes. And especially in video games, the deadlines were, uh, there's a lot of um, 
kind of history and rumor and the, the the prototype and the stereotype of video game companies driving people into the ground and working crazy hours and you know uh the big grind at the end and that's all completely true uh so i was kind of done with that uh, and working working in the medical field those companies move a lot slower so this this is a great job for me right now because i'm still enjoying writing the software but we're not our deadlines are a lot more flexible and the company seem to think we're moving really fast while we think we're moving really slow. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it gives a good, um, it makes us look good without killing ourselves, which is great. Yeah. yeah so, like so, so, so the day to day basically is I'm developing software, I'm putting on my VR headset a lot <laughs> and, uh, um, building, you know, my role at the company is I do, some work on the simulations. My primary job has been to take all the simulations we're doing and make them so that they're multi-user where we can have, especially with COVID, the company, this aspect of it has really taken off. It was originally a sideline, but now people are very much interested in remote learning where they don't have to travel and they can put on a headset and learn from somebody else in a different part of the world and have them demonstrate um, a surgical technique. So yeah, so we're basically bringing in kind of multi-user systems into into what we're doing. Uh, and then, as with most most startups, if you're one of the early employees, um, everybody grabs. There's you know there's a lot to do, so everybody grabs a lot of different pieces. Um, and then the danger with that is nobody ever takes them over, so you end up owning a lot. <laughs> so. I'd say currently I do a lot of different things to the bare minimum level needed and then move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hand the floor over sure. to the other, Mr. Anderson. Sure, uh, yeah, so um, I just wanted to jump in with a, a few more questions. I think you kind of hit on as well, but yeah. um, um, just just around your workplace. Uh, so when you, when you come mm -hmm. to work, uh, could you just kind of describe for us a little bit about what your workplace looks like? Sure. Um, Currently, we're, we're we're very much a startup style company where we have just we've we've moved to I guess this is in our second office now. Um, where we we're right down near Gastown, and it's it's very much a startup space where you know you right now we're walking up five flights of stairs or four flights of stairs, big open space, you know stand up desks, some people up and down, um, fair bit of people in the room giant monitors because we got them cheap <laughs> um and there's about 20 uh, 28 people that are full-time at the company um i'm rarely going into the office these days with uh with the, all the covid restrictions um people are going in nobody's going in every day kind of people are cycling through different days of the week right now that's kind of how we're running that uh but it's a very much a collaborative environment um where we have small stand-up meetings where we're talking about what are the next features to come from. We're um, classically what you would call kind of from a software development side agile, where we talk to our clients a lot. They give us a lot of feedback and we use that information to steer what we do uh, very immediately. So people say they don't like this feature. They like that feature. They want more of this. They don't really care about that thing we started to build. Uh, and so, we try and react and deliver um, what they want. And we work very closely with them about what we're building. Uh, and so that's that's actually really great because you, you get to meet with the clients, you're meeting with each other. Um, I have a few guys that report to me. Um, there's just a bunch of artists and you just kind of talk to people who's the expert in the area. There's a big wide range. So there's a few of us that have been, uh, well, we've, a couple of the guys that I've worked together with for, you know, 26, 28 years kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, just great friends over the years and our, spend our whole career together. And then we have some guys that are right out of school. Uh, I'm working, one of the guys that I work with most closely right now is a student who's just about to graduate from UBC. Um, and he's getting some awesome experience as he's kind of finishing up his kind of internship and He's, I think, learning a ton and, um, 
yeah, it's exciting and it's fun to work with him. He's super keen and um, yeah, it's great to see these. He's, he's, he's learned a lot. And uh, by the same token, I think sometimes we forget how much we've learned along the way and we just kind of throw stuff at him. And uh, I think he feels like he's, you know, just from one hot mess into the next. And <laughs> he's, yeah, you know, he ends the meeting and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get a call. Okay, what were we talking about? <laughs> But that's a super great way to learn, for sure. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how about just, uh, it, it sounds like there's uh, you know, a ton of variety. Um, what, mm. what would a typical day or maybe like a week, how does that break down for you? Sure. So if we look at kind of a weekly schedule, we have like a, we get to work and we all kind of check in with each other about, you know, what has to be done by the end of the week. We'll have a quick chat about that. Um, then typically we'll do some reviews with our quality assurance team. They're doing testing along the way and let us know if there's, you know, things that we think we finished that don't work right. And so we'll always prioritize going back to fix those kind of issues. Then um, from there, really, it's everybody tracks their own kind of list of to-do items using some um, online software. And it's, you know, you, you make a list of these are the things I'm going to get done. You start working on them, tick them off as you're going. We have project managers that help us track and see if we're going to deliver. So they use that to see how things are going and what features need to be tested. They really help coordinate um, with our QA department. Um, and, uh, but most of it is kind of heads down work Be because we're doing a lot of, um, online work now we're often like spending a lot of time on like zoom or we use microsoft teams but we're calling each other asking people to um you know help out with a, an online test and all our software is distributed through kind of internet and the cloud-based systems now that we've been building so you know i'm sitting in my basement i can make a change, submit that change to kind of a cloud server thing and it distributes the software to everybody else. They can put on their headsets and we can test stuff together. And, um, so it's, and then we're always on Zoom calls and talking. So while we're, everybody's working at home or mostly, uh, it's still very much um, working directly with lots of people. Um, can you tell us what you like the most or the least about your, your, your profession? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting question. I think for me, the, the timing of when I came into the, the industry, um, I've had a very, um, not easy path, but a very opportunistic path because of the timing of when I've joined and as the industry's grown, um, everywhere I've been, I've been, you know, one of the senior guys, you know, from year two at the other company, when we were growing from the very first company, we'd grow like crazy and you're two years into your thing and you're one of the senior people. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I've actually really enjoyed being one of the leaders and um, helping to steer the company. So, you know, I've kind of gone full circle where when I first joined, it was a very small team you know, my very first thing out of university, building software, making the, you know, in that case it was games, but building a product. And it's essentially the same thing, interactive software. Um, and then over the career, it's kind of, it changed into managing teams. And, you know, in our, our first startup company, we grew up to about a hundred people, 90 something. Um, and then we were acquired by EA, you know, I took on the leadership role in there and didn't do any development at all for a while. And so got experience with working with teams and businesses. Um, I think after all that in the end, so as we, I've kind of ramped up with who reports and who doesn't, the, the thing I actually still enjoy the most would be when you actually finish the feature for the first time and it actually works. That is the, <laughs> Yeah. You're like, oh my God, it worked. <laughs> a sense of accomplishment, a tick. <laughs> that's that's something, um, yeah, very huge and very much motivating to most people that write software is the sense that I've built this, it's super complicated and it works. Awesome. Uh, and it's, it's super satisfying. And I, I really enjoyed the management side of things and um, 
what I enjoyed the least was as the companies grew, especially when I was working with electronic arts, um, the internal politics and, uh, you know, it's a, it's kind of a catch all phrase for it's just, it's difficult to work within the system there. Um, and, yeah. you know, you can throw, <laughs> you can throw expletives and complain and raise certain issues, but in the end, it's just a super big organization that's trying to do the best it can. And uh, sometimes that's, it makes it hard to make changes. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they have much bigger issues and deadlines. And so you're constrained and it's really hard to kind of steer, steer the ship um, when you're there. And so we, at these smaller startup companies and when they've been our companies, you know, I'm a, when I'm with the company director, um, the management role, is a lot more fun because then you can make a change. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of the day-to-day -day tasks, really still just writing the software after all these years is still pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. What are some of your most memorable experiences in your career? <laughs> um, uh, that's interesting. Um, most memorable. I mean, I think the the single product I'm most proud of for sure would have been we released a game called Sleeping Dogs, um, and just getting that thing out. Um, we started that was we we started that product as like the first contract we signed at the second startup in two thousand and seven or eight seven end of two thousand seven, and we start we we started that contract with Activision based on um, the guy who was the main shareholder and ran the company, a guy named Bobby Kodak came to visit us and he knew a bunch of us had done a startup before. There was only like 10 people in the room and we wanted $21 million from him because we were gonna build him a great game. <laughs> and we had a stack of resumes of people we worked with and hired before saying like, they'd come work with us if we got a contract. And we showed him one demo for like, a simple PC graphic thing. <laughs> but then he, he was actually pretty sharp and he started asking us a bunch of questions. And he had some questions from another guy in the room who was more of a tech savvy kind of technical guy. Um, and they kind of had a conf conference and they're like, yeah, these guys know what they're doing, let's do it. And it was just, wow. great, we got $21 million, let's build a game. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's Now crazy. it turned out to only be half the money we needed, but. <laughs> <laughs> But you had fun doing it. <laughs> yeah, it was a long haul. I mean, just getting that out, though, was it was four years. Oh, well, five, really, to when it was released. It was canceled in the middle, picked up by another publisher. Um, at one point, we had 200 and something people, 270 people working on the game. Um, wow. It was crazy. It, it was an enormous undertaking. Um, and it came out, it's been really well reviewed. It sold pretty well. I don't know, I think, I think the total sales now is up to about 7 million or something. Holy smokes. Um, but we didn't get a dime of royalties. <laughs> we spent way too much money making it. <laughs> but uh, we didn't lose any money on it, so that was good. <laughs> That's good. And it's, it's Sleeping Dogs is the game? Sleeping dogs, yeah. Perfect. First thing oh. I'm going to Google when we're done this. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it still holds up pretty well. There's, it, it was nice. I saw something a little while ago. So people are talking about it. Came out in 2012, and then there was a an update for PS4, and uh, it releasing with all the, the extra content and stuff. Maybe um, 2014, maybe. Uh, but yeah, people are like nostalgic. They like it. Uh, it was a Grand Theft Auto style of game where it's a big open world and you can kind of explore and do all these missions. And, you know, we had like Emma Stone in it and uh, <laughs> this super famous like actor from Hong Kong who I didn't know. Uh, I can't remember his name even. Awesome. Um, but Lucy Liu, uh, she voiced some stuff. It's like, it was pretty cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was, and then that, that was, yeah, just getting that game out was monumental. <laughs> Didn't think we'd ever get there. Yeah. Uh, Dave, I, I noticed that you you mentioned a few of the types of people that you work with. I was wondering if you mm -hmm. could just tell us a little bit more about just in, in your world, who are the people that you tend to interact with and, and work with, you know, fairly regularly? Sure. Yeah. Um, my, 
my day to day is with other software and engineers who, you know, we're building software and stuff, but, um, you know, we, throughout all the companies, we've really tried to kind of let the right person like who should be making the decision, make the decision. And I'd say that's one of the other benefits of small companies. So, um, you know, there's lots of cases where we want to do a feature and we're not too sure. So we'll consult, consult with the artist who we know has worked with a whole bunch of physical simulation systems and, you know, bring him in. And so the general list of people would be mostly software engineers. Then we consult with, there's a group of artists that, um, what we call rig the scenes where they're, they're building objects in the scenes, but they also have to hook up and say like, at this point here, it's a joint, you know, and the, the table can swivel here, or, you know, we're doing an incision and the, you know, the, the, the incision has to open up this way and it has, you know, a certain amount of elasticity and stuff. And so there's artists that kind of, it's called rigging the scene or rigging the animations to behave in a certain way. Um, so we work with a lot of people with a lot of experience in that. And then there's the general um, artists that are building models, which are just the geometric representations of stuff and creating the textures and the lighting and um, all that kind of um, the visuals really. Um, and then from there, I spend time with the clients a little bit. Um, there's a guy at a couple of the companies where we talk to just about the features and the technical aspects of the job. So um, I just kind of represent our online group um, for those kind of discussions. Um, and then, I mean, really that's, and then our, our CEO is the one so actual surgeon in the company. And so he's the guy who gives us real feedback um, on the actual procedure. So we build them all, nothing obviously is done uh, to what we want, it's all done to the specs from, um, we specialize in orthopedic surgery. So everything we do is around uh, specific orthopedic procedures. So like doing a shoulder replacement, a knee replacement, that kind of thing. And so we're, we're simulating very specific procedures using specific equipment. And so um, he gives us feedback on exactly like, no, you wouldn't hold it here, you'd hold it there. The, the ideal placement is here, it's not there. So there's documentation we read and there's things we put together, but you, we wouldn't get anywhere out of the gate without having uh, an expert on staff, like, you know, mm -hmm. who actually operates and does this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and I think Dave, you, you hit on this um, probably quite a bit already, but uh, for someone that's in your field or, you know, what, what other places uh, or options are there for someone um, in your field? Well, I mean, there's, um, I, I think with the general, the good thing about software is you can take the skills. They're very transplantable to almost any field. Like uh, as people, you know, when we shut down the previous company, a bunch of guys went and worked at Apple and I think they were um, working on different things and, you know, one guy went and left and he joined a com company doing um, stuff for self-driving cars and other guys went to Amazon to work on web systems and a guy went to work at a company doing satellite imagery where they're putting cameras on the space station and, you know, there's all these interesting I options that basically just being good at writing software. Um, you know, I just before I took the job with my friends, they were, I wasn't sure they were really going to get off the ground. They didn't know they'd get off the ground and they <laughs> got some money. So they offered me a job just before that. I was looking at taking a job at a company called D-Wave doing quantum computing. And I don't know anything about quantum computing and, you know, but so many of these jobs, they know they're not going to hire somebody who knows anything about what they're building. They just need people who have been successful at delivering um, and getting software done. So that, I mean, that's the biggest skill you get from, you know, it's really coming to work every day and just sticking with it. Uh, the, I think, I think one of the things some of the people don't really appreciate is you don't need that concrete experience. I know a lot of people who have, um, I guess, asked me about games and getting into gaming and game development and stuff. Uh, many people will come to it from, I need to be an expert before I can actually, like I need to be an expert at making games before I make games. 
And that's really not true. Uh, there's often entry level positions. What you do need, and more so now than you did kind of in the early days though, is a solid education and some proof that you've got the background, right? They don't need you to have the expertise in what they want you to do, but what they want is to know that you know the fundamentals and you can use those fundamentals and you've built something with them. So whether it's student projects, stuff on your own, um, so you can hit the ground, not, and not as an expert, but you can hit it with the tools you need to learn. And from there, you know, just applying for entry level jobs um, and going to career fairs and which they haven't exactly been having lately. Mm -hmm. But you know, the industry in Vancouver is up and down. And I, I really do think uh, when things open up again, um, there's gonna be again, more hiring in, in a big way. Uh, the mm -hmm. industry certainly is still growing. So Dave, um, what skills and interests would someone need to be successful in your profession and some of the other professions you've mentioned? So what kind of attributes, personal attributes and skills would people need? Uh, I, think, I think the biggest kind of is just, you have to have that first interest in, in what you're doing, right? Like this is, um, this is, writing software is definitely not something you want to get into because you think it's the ideal thing that's going to make you money and it's trendy and whatever. <laughs> and it might, and there's like, there's a lot of people that write software and I've encountered and met a bunch of them that really don't like what they do. Cause not everybody does. Um, mm -hmm. And getting some initial experience and trying it out um, and deciding if you like it, because if you don't, it's, like if you don't like those initial experiences of learning and growing as a, as a learning as a learning programmer, you're not mm -hmm. going to like it later on. <laughs> yes. um, but the the core skills that you might get from just the, the background of, of studying and, and the fundamentals of math and of being able to write like written communication is also super important. You need to be able to write an email like. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, like, and I, and I don't say that in a joking manner, like you, <laughs> we've, we've, hi we've hired people and we've fired them because they just, their, their written communication is just not up to snuff, right? You need to be able to, you don't have to be a literary expert. You don't have to be writing no. dissertations and essays, but there's a basic core level of communication that is super important. Um, yeah, so that, that English 12 is really important as is your post-secondary English it is. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. It's. It's. It's great to to, to come to it and uh, and the other one really the the other skill that suits everybody super well is um, being able to talk to people <laughs> and you know I've I've worked with some guys that were super super brilliant and wondered why they could never get a management job and you have to sit down and talk with them and you know ask them when's the last time they walked over to somebody's desk to get an answer. And they're like, well, I just sent him an email. And it's like, he sits right there. Like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like afraid to talk to people. Um, yeah. So getting over that and understanding that in all these jobs, they may be technical, but there is no job in software or technical development now that's solo. You, you need to be no. able to, to work collaboratively um, yeah, team player, right? You, have you to need be to be a team, team player, player and you need to accept that other people make mistakes and that you make mistakes, mm -hmm. right? You, it's super important to be able to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm really sorry, I did this. Mm -hmm. Or when somebody makes a mistake to go to them and, and to, to know yourself well enough and the confidence to go over to them and say, hey, this isn't what we need. We need to change it. Mm -hmm. And as... I would say the most successful software engineer I know are always open to hearing like, oh, okay, great. Let's just change it. If that's not what we need, let's just change it. And those are the people that you're going to want to work with. And those are the ones that are going to have the jobs, not the people that are going to stick to their guns and say, what I did was right in the first place. <laughs> um, uh, yes. It's, and and you, you, you do run into those people. And, um, you know, on the other hand, if, if, if you are, you know, some people actually are as smart as they think they are. <laughs> when, when we were working on Sleeping Dogs, 
um, I was the engineering, like I was the technical director for the project. Um, so at our biggest, I had, there's probably 40 engineers working on the, like programmers working on the game at one point. Um, mm -hmm. A gigantic mass of people trying to contribute code and programming. And I spent probably easily a quarter of my time managing two different guys mm -hmm. only. <laughs> and they had trouble getting along with people. And because there were so many people working, other people would do things that might influence what they did and it would wreck stuff. <laughs> but the reality was they were both unbelievably brilliant. <laughs> like, <laughs> like sometimes they're worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but you can't be that guy unless you really are worth it. And there's not, there's not very many of them. <laughs> you know, anyone else, I would have fired those guys. <laughs> yeah. It's important to be able to get along with others. Right. And, yeah. and work on building good relationships and be a good team player. Yeah. Um, one more thing I have to ask is, is there anything someone in high school could or should be doing right now to help them prepare for a, a career in your field? They, they absolutely should be just trying to build their own little student projects and doing things for fun. Like if, if we're talking video games, they should be using any of the kind of downloadable and free to get access to kind of game engines, go through tutorials and try and build you know, the simplest little um, simulations or they could be little games, they could just be little toys that you kind of play with interactive software, um, which would let them gain, going through the tutorials, you're not gonna be an expert, but you can start to create stuff. And that's the greatest way to find out if you really enjoy that feeling of empowerment and the, the feeling of, of accomplishment when you build and, and achieve things. If you know, if you've, if you've put in, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours working on these tutorials and learning a new system and, and just starting to get your feet under you and you really hate it, um, you know, it's, it's a good time to question, is this, the, is this the right thing for me? Maybe there's a different aspect. Maybe you should actually be building the artwork, um, mm -hmm. right? There's people, one of the guys that's the founder of the company I'm at now, um, God love him, but after 35 years or whatever it is, we've been making games and stuff. And, <laughs> He's still not that technical, <laughs> but he's a great artist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that probably mirrors sort of what uh, Mr. Anderson has been telling students about their capstone project that they have to do for their yeah. career at Connections 12. If you're working on something and it's really not enjoyable, then you're probably not on the right path. I, I, I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's a lot of stuff around, like you need to seek your passion and, you know, don't let money guide you and pick your, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't agree with that a thousand percent, <laughs> but if you don't like what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of room within those kind of mantras of follow your passions, the rest will happen. And, um, you know, but there's probably more than one thing you like. And if you can pick one that actually is a living too, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, no, that's excellent advice there. Um, how about um, just where, where do you see your profession sort of headed in the future? Um, I think it's getting more, um, I guess, distant from, you know, when I started, everything's kind of pulling away from the lowest level, right? When, when we originally started writing, you know, interactive software, it was what's called, you know, assembly language where you're writing very, very simple instructions like, you know, get number A and add it to number B, put it in slot C kind of thing. And then from those simple building blocks, you build your functionality. Um, and now everything is in very high level languages, primarily in my development and the work that we do now. Um, we do almost all our programming using a visual system where we're dragging little bubbles around on a graph and it's kind of it's a flow of execution and you you know you have a little bubble that's like you know basically like display the hands you know turn the hands on and off and we've kind of built the functionality of each of these little bubbles or you know rotate the display you know 90 degrees whatever it is um, and so as we're moving forward everything is getting higher level and less specific and so it becomes more important
important um, to think about kind of the bigger picture and how the architecture and how things fit together. Uh, the, the, the underpinnings and the, the simplest, you know, just making it work. Um, a, lot of that, a lot of that work is being, in my role, handled by other stuff. Like we use a commercial game engine that has, it's, it's the game engine that powers the game Fortnite, um, which virtually every kid on the planet, as far as I know, plays. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and they have literally hundreds and hundreds of people working on the technology behind that. So, you know, we just take a step back and it's like, okay, you guys got the technology side. <laughs> mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is use it in a, in a novel and different way um, with its own complexities um, because we have to be so precise and accurate. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of the, what we bring to it and trying to do something different with it. And so that's, that's, I think, the space that people should be targeting if you were looking at interactive software is not that lowest level technology stuff. It's the, what, what am I going to do with it and building the tools to do that. And, and at that, at the level we're working at now, it's, you still need to know all your math. You, you can't, you just can't do anything if you don't know your math. <laughs> um, and, and it does, it's, you know, and it's not your doctorate level, you know, we're talking Basically, first year university math will get you through. Um, that said, any less than that, probably not. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you need, there's, there's, there's a certain level there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's thinking of the higher level and focusing on those kind of game engines and the, the pre-made systems rather than writing everything from scratch. Um, it's a it's a fool's game to think you're going to compete and write your basic core technology and eat the lunch of somebody who's using technology written by a team of several hundred people. Um, you're probably not going to win that battle. A good point. Yeah. But but there's definitely room for individual small projects created by small groups. Um, I've in my previous job, you know, I met with these students from high schools here who were uh, very interested in programming and games. And I met them on a similar career day and then they came down to the office and we talked and um, they had since started up their own small little mobile game company that they started doing stuff as students. Um, and then a few of them went on to university. One of them stuck around and was trying to just build it up and stuff. And uh, it was super awesome to see them getting excited and, and just going for it, uh, you know, and that's, totally possible right if you just get the right idea these days it's and luck because <laughs> there's a lot of people doing that stuff <laughs> yeah um dave I, I just got actually one more question for you um as as we finish up here any just kind of general advice that you would have for young people as they're considering career choices and then making that transition into you know whatever their next steps are after uh high school um I don't know, I guess I think of that as what, would, what do I wish somebody would have told me? Um, I think, uh, I think, yeah, I guess, you know, it kind of comes back to make sure you're doing something you enjoy. Um, I, I kind of fell into the video game stuff. I've never, I never was like a, a hardcore gamer, never really played them all the years that I made them. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I kept going because I always enjoyed actually the creation of them. And I, you know, back in high school, I made like on those old, old, like, you know, Apple and Commodore computers from way back in the day, um, <laughs> would make a few little simple things for fun. And uh, that's how I knew I at least enjoyed it. And that's kind of what spurred me on to, um, you know, take that first job at a game company where I didn't expect to. I was thought I'd be doing hardware design and working at one of the engineering companies here in Vancouver and just couldn't even get an interview back then. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I just kind of fell into it and decided that I liked it. And if you're in a job that you like and it has, it's not a dead end job and it's something where you can, you can see yourself growing. And for me, most importantly, it add variety, um, you know, but yeah, in terms of, I guess, your core question of what's the advice, make sure you know what you want 
to do like what you enjoy doing I think a lot of people don't know that I know my kids don't know that yet <laughs> um, yeah like it's not all that important to know exactly what you are going to do for a career but know what makes you happy what kind of things you like start thinking about mm -hmm. uh, what subjects you enjoy in school if it's not math yeah. or sciences maybe this isn't the right path if it is maybe it is yeah ab absolutely like um some people don't enjoy it. That's fine. You, there's mm -hmm. other things to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of people do. It's It's been fun. I've worked with a lot of people. A lot of people have put in really long hours and grinded it really out because it's still fun for them. You know, mm -hmm. they like doing it. Um, I don't know. I think the other core life lesson I never got until I was well into university was um, practice, get better. Like, <laughs> just because you don't know it now, that you know just keep coming back and just keep doing it um you know it's uh, practice makes perfect <laughs> yeah yeah or, or at least better <laughs> Which would be i have guitar. one last sorry yeah. oh i'd say just, i can see my picture i can see my guitar amp behind me i'm terrible I but i just keep trying <laughs> <laughs> i have one last question because you intrigued me with all your talk about the artists at work um mm video game creation just curious if you can tell us what kind of a background somebody that wants to be an artist for video gaming mm -hmm. what 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 should what are their backgrounds like what's their educational they, they've had we've had people with various different backgrounds some people i've worked with came out right out of like emily carr and they had like an animation program um so like a fine arts dedicated fine arts school mm -hmm. uh, some people have been artists that have come out of um basically programming uh, game design courses who realized along the way they needed to make some art assets and kind of figured out that they actually like doing that better uh, and so started doing online like their own self online training so their actual accreditation was as technical people but the the biggest um, I think the biggest kind of training programs that you get now are these actual digital programs which would be things from like there's Vancouver Film School and the Art Institute and, and th places like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think the Emily Carr, I think has produced some of our best. If I, if I think about the background, um, the people coming out of that fine arts school, when they've been able to translate them into the digital world uh, have produced probably some of our um, best work. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I've been just passed a note here and I've been asked to ask Cameron if he has a question. <laughs> I can't hear him. Can you guys hear it? Okay. Uh, it seems like Cameron, your mic might not be working. But Cameron, you can always type your, your question too into the chat box there as well, and, and it's visible there. see anything here let me just see yeah i see the um the mic function on i just i'm not we're not hearing you cameron or, or, oh there you oh, go you want to read it out Dave? okay Sure. Yeah. Cameron just asked, um, he said, I was just wondering if there were any post-secondary courses you found particularly interesting and or beneficial. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I think the ones that were the most beneficial would have been the basic math courses, of course. Um, the, um, the actual, the actual programming ones, um, would probably be second uh, that we did. And then 
uh, an interesting and, and unexpectedly beneficial, probably the technical writing course um, that we, we, had, we were forced to take as engineers and through university. Um, I found, uh, especially working at the bigger companies, we need to produce sometimes giant, giant documents of technical design uh, before, um, you know, delivering different aspects of our contracts or to get them, um, you know, basically giant technical design documents and, and having, having that background and uh, even the old textbooks to draw on always, uh, it was always like good form and how to, how to put things. Um, again, when you're dealing with external clients, being able to put our best foot forward and make them feel like they're dealing with people who um, can communicate well and really have their everything buttoned up rather than looking sloppy. Um, there's no doubt that it improved our situation and standing with them. So uh, yeah, I think the technical writing course uh, is super important. I was just um, reflecting right before I started um, interviewing you today, Dave. And for some reason, I thought that your degree was a computer engineering degree, but yours is, it's electrical. It's electrical, yeah. What's the difference between those two? Um, the computer engineering degree has, has more programming um, and it's more strictly digital design. It does a lot of electronics design too but it's a lot more software architecture and stuff. And practically for what I'm doing probably would have been um, a better match. Wasn't my intention, you know, going through university was to go into, into hardware design and um, mm. control systems. Uh, again, though, it's about learning about what you like, right? We yeah. did my first couple control systems course and thought this math is just too much for me. <laughs> and I like math. <laughs> and uh, so then I kind of moved on to digital communications and um, there's a lot of crossover, but the, the computer engineering really is more, it does more of the actual programming and software architecture and stuff. Uh, the electrical, we dealt more with um, analog hardware, things like, you know, microwave antennas and um, silicon design and the physics behind like, you know, and this is a long time ago, the very basics behind the, the physics of making the silicon and all that kind of stuff and how the transistors work in ICs, um, which again was actually good background. You know, I had a co-op job where that's what we were doing, planning out how to make new transistors and testing them. And, um, you know, so it's, it, it's great background for that. But again, you don't, you only know a smidgen of what you actually need to know when you actually have a real job, but, you know, they don't expect you to. No, no one's going to know that without doing it. Exactly. So that just proves that, um, you know, you don't necessarily to be right on target for where you end up on your career Not with your all. educational path, right? You've built on that and become what you are today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been a, a different career kind of moving from different place to place and stuff. And, um, but I've enjoyed the smaller companies. I know some people very much really like working at the big companies and um, I think there's a real trade-off there, right? Like mm -hmm. I've worked with people and we have a small company and they, you know, they want to be promoted and they're great. And there's like, there's the only job above you is mine and I'm the owner. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and for some of those people, their, their, their job, their choice was to go to a company like electronic arts where, you know, from being a team lead, they can move up to be a group lead, to move up, to be a studio director. And if they, kept going, maybe, you know, move into like a board level role across multiple studios and groups. Um, but yeah, I, I was kind of on that path there and I just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. So it's been, uh, for me, it's been more important to work with my friends, really. Okay. Um... I don't, uh, I don't see any more questions in our chat unless Cameron and Jared have anything more for us. Otherwise, Dave will, um, will, will, I guess let you go here. We really, really appreciate the time. Uh, yeah, well, I hope, I hope it's been useful. Hope, uh, 
It's been really interesting. Thanks a lot, Dave. And um, I will connect with you um, via email after this. Um, I want to get, uh, I'd like to send out a, we have a little thank you gift to send out to you for your time. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, Good to absolutely. you, David. Super Thanks, informative. Thank you so much. Jared Cameron, you know, stay in school. <laughs> Hit the slopes. That's always good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that was actually one of the best post-secondary courses I took too, was a technical ski course in New Zealand. <laughs> cool. Yeah, learn, 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 learn your skiing properly. It helps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again. And uh, we will, uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. All right, great. Okay, bye. Thanks, Dave. Bye. -bye. Yeah. bye.